so good evening. My name is Jeremy Schneider. I'm the Outreach and Programs Coordinator with the Orange County Land Trust. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, our organization is dedicated to conserving Orange County's uh, wildlife corridors, agricultural lands, and diverse habitats by partnering with willing landowners on permanent conservation agreements. Uh, to date, we've protected close to 6,400 acres across Orange County. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about us, you can visit us on our website at uh, www.org oclt.org. Okay, so uh, joining us this evening. And uh, before we get started, I just want to recognize some of our co-sponsors, uh, Black Rock Forest Consortium and the Black Dirt Branch of the Quality Deer Management Association. I also want to recognize some of uh, this evening's attendees. Uh, there's some Orange County Land Trust board members in attendance, including uh, Eleanor Hart, uh, Board President Arlene Nolan and Kathy Hunter. Uh, we also have uh, Jason Ketchum from the Quality Deer Management Association and I'll, uh, the Black Dirt Branch, and I'll uh, introduce him uh, further in a second. Uh, we also have uh, State Senator Colin Schmidt in attendance. Welcome, Senator. And uh, last thing, if you would like to share your comments, uh, observations, or questions during the presentation, you can use the chat feature um, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, all questions asked in the comments section will be uh, answered. Okay, uh, so first I just want to introduce Jason Ketchum from the uh, Black Dirt branch of QDMA. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, Jason Ketchum here. I am the president of the local Quality Deer Management Association branch. Um, I mean, for those of you that are not uh, aware of the, the QDMA, the Quality Deer Management Association, we're a, a nationally recognized not-for-profit organization focused on the, ensuring the, the future of specifically the white-tailed deer and, uh, and the habitat, wildlife habitat and our hunting heritage surrounding it. Uh, our branch supports Orange, Rockland and Sullivan counties. Uh, we're made up of uh, a, a, a large group of uh, volunteer members here throughout the area, um, just working through conservation efforts and, uh, and just a, a bunch of guys that are really you know, I, I like like mindset and uh, and enjoy being outdoors. Uh, I've been talking with Jeremy for for a number of years now, and uh, we're we're happy to be here to co-sponsor the event. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Okay. Uh, next, I just want to introduce Dr. Bill Schuster, uh, Executive Director of the Black Rock Forest Consortium. All right, uh, thank you, Jeremy, uh, very much, and to Orange County Land Trust for organizing and hosting this important and timely event. Uh, and welcome to you all on behalf of Black Rock Forest. Uh, if you don't know us, we're a Cornwall-based nonprofit uh, with a mission to advance scientific understanding of the natural world. And we run the 4,000 acre Black Rock Forest as a field station for research and education while remaining open to public recreation. Uh, EHD is new around here, so first I'm going to briefly describe it and where it came from, and then I'll introduce Aaron Kulata uh, from our staff to tell you more. EHD is epizootic hemorrhagic disease. It's a disease of deer only and some of their close relatives, but not humans. In the past six weeks or so, hundreds of deer, if not more, have been killed all around us by it. Though interestingly, not even one Black Rock Forest that we know of to date. It's caused by a virus. Yes, another virus outbreak. Uh, it is endemic. It's a virus that's endemic to midge populations. These are small flies that generally breed in standing shallow water and they spread the disease to deer by biting them. It is not the same as CWD, which you may have heard of in the past, chronic wasting disease. That's a brain wasting disease similar to uh, mad cow disease that's called by pro uh, caused by proteins called prions that get into the brains of affected wildlife. Uh, CWD is a terrible thing. It's highly contagious. 
Uh, it's potentially transmissible to humans. It's not currently found in New York State. Um, the, the New York State has a very large effort monitoring for CWD. The one time it did outbreak in 2005, they eliminated it. So we're talking about something really very uh, different here. Um, EHD is new to our area, um, but it's been known in the US for over a century and is in other parts of the world. Now that we have it, we'll probably have it for the long run. Uh, but with ups and downs over time, as Aaron will explain, and hopefully with less impact on our deer populations uh, as our populations build up some resistance to it. Uh, to tell you more about it now, I'm happy to introduce Black Rock Forest Aaron Kulana. Uh, Aaron came to Black Rock Forest uh, on a Student Conservation Association internship uh, late in 2017. He graduated SUNY Cobalt Skill uh, in 2018 with a degree in wildlife management. And he was so good that we hired him on immediately full time and have been happy to have him with us uh, ever since. He serves with us as an environmental educator and also as the coordinator of our visitor services program. Uh, but Aaron's career and really his passion is wildlife and wildlife management. That's why I think he's the best person on our staff to talk with you about this today or tonight. So uh, take it away, Aaron. Thank you, uh, thank you, Bill. Um, just wanted to say thank you guys for uh, tuning in tonight and especially thank you to the Orange County Land Trust and um, the Black Dirt TDMA chapter. Um, it's a pleasure to come in and uh, be able to talk about this and I know it's a super hot topic. So um, I'm gonna get right into the presentation and uh, like uh, Jeremy mentioned, if you guys have questions, um, you can throw them in the chat box and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through them as we, uh, as we finish out and get into our discussion portion. So, can everybody uh, see my screen here? Good, okay. So the topic is EHD, epizootic hemorrhagic disease in the Hudson Valley. Um, as you guys can see on the right hand side of the screen here, this is a trail camera uh, image that we got back in September, early September. Um, you can see the buck is still in velvet and uh, it is clearly foaming at the mouth and that's, that's one of the telltale signs. Um, I wanted to get into the cause a little bit. So EHD is a common virus carried by midges of the genus Gulacoides. Um, a lot of times these would be called noceums um, or gnats, things like that. Um, it's most prevalent in years of drought and prolonged summer conditions, especially this year where um, we had a pretty hot August, pretty, pretty dry August. And that seemed to kind of transition into September, especially those first few weeks. Um, and we really see it uh, in areas with high deer density, especially in pro close proximity to standing water. Um, so those of you that might live in kind of the western area or western parts of Orange County where we have a lot more farm and ag. Um, and then throughout Orange County, we have a fair number of suburban development. We're also seeing it there too. Um, especially in warm and dry weather, um, because that creates those ideal breeding pools for the midges, especially from let's say August until October. Um, and as deer gather at these available water sources with uh, dwindling water around, we start to see it increases the risk of contracting the virus. This is just a, a photo um, from Grandview Outdoors. Uh, I believe this is out in Wisconsin. As you can see, this is late summer, the bucks in velvet on um, the still their summer coats and they're the two deer drinking from a watering hole. Um, as you can see, if you look at the doe on the far side, the water is not very deep. There seems to be a film across the top of the, uh, the water surface. There's vegetation coming in and around the water and it looks to be some organic matter inside that water as well. So those are kind of your ideal locations that are gonna hold water late into the summer. Um, and they're gonna get warm, they're gonna have organic matter, they're gonna be high in um, organic matter, but really low in oxygen content. So that's those real key areas where the midges are gonna to wanna to gravitate towards and they're gonna breed in, in large numbers. And that's also um, where the deer are gonna be finding water, especially late in the year. 
uh, sometimes they might uh, mention mud flats or, or muddy areas. This would be something similar to um, like a muddy pool or a muddy, muddy flat. Uh, this is a, a photo of the actual midge itself um, of the Janus Coolacoides. You can see it's, uh, it's one on the left is taking a blood meal. The one on the right um, is not full of blood, but it, this is on a human skin but they obviously feed on deer and, and have no problem getting underneath, uh, especially their summer coats that are, are thin and, and much easier to penetrate. Uh, a little bit more on the midge. Uh, I really wanted to touch on this because uh, it's really important to know the, the special conditions and those areas um, where those midges are breeding and how that relates to the deer and, and the probability of the deer being affected in, in large quantities. Um, so like I had mentioned, they prefer shallow pools, uh, warm sunlit pools that are high in organic matter and low in oxygen. Um, for those of you that, that are familiar with uh, farm and ag, these would be like cattle ponds or agricultural drainages um, that may have some kind of uh, livestock material in them, or um, they may have salts in them. We, we read in multiple places that uh, the midges actually are very tolerant of poor water quality and they're actually very tolerant of salts. So those of you that are familiar with ag know that uh, it's not uncommon to see salt licks out on um, the feeding areas or, or near the actual uh, cattle ponds or, or watering holes. Um, the forested and suburban areas where we've also seen an outbreak um, also may have some shallow, dry, muddy pools as we get into those later August months. Um, and those are also going to serve, serve as prime uh, habitat for mid larva. And, and the biggest thing we're looking at are, are really shallow pools that are, you know, a few inches less than a foot in depth. Um, so sunlight is penetrating all the way through the forest canopy. If there's no forest canopy, then it's right onto the water. It's heating up the water. Excuse me. And then um, that's also creating a an unlikely situation for other species to breed in there, right? So there's not going to be any kind of fish or, or other maybe macro invertebrates that would be in there feeding on the larva. So that's kind of what we're looking at as far as a perfect breeding habitat for these midges. Um, just a little bit about the history and the range. So um, one thing I wanted to touch on was that um, you may hear people say, uh, EHD or blue tongue or kind of use the, the two uh, interchangeably. BT is, is, is blue tongue and EHD obviously there's a lot of hemorrhagic disease. These are both referred to as hemorrhagic diseases. Um, and uh, Bill had mentioned they've been around for a while. They've, they've been known to exist since about the 1890s across parts of the US and even in other countries. Um, but it was first officially documented in New Jersey in 1955. Um, Shop and a few other people put out a paper in uh, 1960 that had kind of coined the term EHD. Um, and EHD was documented in New York in 2007 and uh, 2011, but I wouldn't be surprised if people didn't hear about it. Um, I can't look at everyone right now, but. I was just wondering how many people have heard about EHD prior to 2020. If you could just put your hand up, I'll kind of scroll through. Not too many, right? Maybe a few. I see John. But um, yeah, so it's oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. It's uh it's pretty new here in New York. It happened in really small quantities. It was in um Rockland County, um Albany County, I believe Schenectady County as well, and then out in Western New York in, um, I believe it was Niagara County, I believe Buffalo. So it did happen in New York uh, in 2007 and 2001, but it was it was low numbers and most people probably didn't hear about it. Um, and with many things uh, relating to uh, wildlife or just life in general, uh, that little thing called social media and uh, Facebook definitely spread the word like wildfire. Um, so that's something that I've really keyed in on is, is you see a picture of a dead deer on your Facebook or your Instagram or whatever, and um, immediately people start sending around talking to it and the message spreads really quickly. So in 2011, it may have happened, um, but there wasn't as easily of a method to kind of transport that information. So I think that's probably why too many people haven't heard about it. Um, and it's, it's commonly documented in Midwestern states annually. Um, 
I have a friend who's a biologist uh, out in Indiana and their state biologists see it every single year um, in usually low numbers, but um, occasionally uh, they will get a pretty bad outbreak. Last year in 2019, um, they had a pretty bad outbreak in Southern Indiana. And then back in 2012 in the state of Iowa, they noticed something similar to what we're seeing in our region this year. So large numbers of dead deer are, are turning up. Um, a lot of older age class deer are, are taking a, uh, taking their toll on them. And you'll start to see um, hunters are really keen in on uh, finding old bucks dead in creeks and that word kind of spreads really quickly. So um, it's not as common out here, but in the Midwest, people have been dealing with it for a while. Um, so like Bill had mentioned, it, it might be around here for a little while now, and we may start to see this kind of cycle that other states have, have seen in years prior. Um, like we'd also touched on, the disease is really only documented in whitetails, um, mule deer, and pronghorn antelope. Uh, common question that I've gotten, um, are my dogs okay? Um, are my pets okay? Are my kids okay playing outside? Um, those questions are, are completely warranted. Um, a lot of people right off the bat um, reached out to me and said, hey, I have a dead deer, it's right near the water. Um, did someone poison the water? Can I let my dog out? Um, can I let my kids play? Um, and being that EHD is transmitted through the midge, um, and humans and, and other animals are, are not susceptible to uh, getting the virus from the midge, uh, it, is, it is okay. Um, a lot of people also ask if it's okay or safe to eat the deer meat. Um, as far as everybody knows, it is completely safe. Uh, I know a lot of people that have held off and, and not uh, chose to not uh, eat any, any deer early in the season. Um, I guess I could be your guinea pig. Um, I have harvested a deer this year and I have eaten it and I'm here today. So um, I guess that's a small sample size, but uh, it is safe to eat uh, the deer this year. Obviously, if you harvest a deer and it looks sick and shows many of the signs, I would probably err on the side of caution, contact, uh, your local DEC office here in here in uh, Orange County, that, that's region three. So you could contact the New Paltz office, have them come down, take a look at it. And uh, if the deer does look worthy, they will probably reissue you a new tag. Um, and then the one thing that we, we've really seen and I've really looked into is these outbreaks are cyclic in nature, right? So they happen, let's say every five to seven years, maybe every five to 10 years. Um, and that's due to immunity in the herd, right? So I'll get into kind of um, the infection and mortality rate in a minute, but once deer start to kind of uh, gather a little bit of immunity to the virus, uh, those deer then are not gonna die from it. So we'll start, we'll look into that in a little bit. This is just a distribution of both, uh, both hemorrhagic diseases. Uh, this is from 1980 to 2015. So as you guys can see, all of the, the red, uh, counties on the map are areas that have confirmed cases of, of either blue tongue or, or EHD. Um, and if you look at New York, you can kind of see there's about three or four counties, right? So we got Rockland County, Albany County, um, and then uh, we got Connecticut County, I believe, and then Niagara County. But if you look, as you get towards the Midwest, um, and you get out and towards uh, the Dakotas, you'll start to see that it, it's pretty common in almost every county in a lot of these states, and especially down in the south, um, where, it's, where, uh, where it's a lot hotter and a, a lot drier, and you would think those conditions are better. They, and the deer may have immunity, there's still uh, confirmed cases all along the coastline too, down into Florida, even parts of Texas, um, and then out once you get past the Rockies. So one question um, that I got a lot early on was, well, how do you know if it's EHD? Um, so roughly about seven days after the, the midge bites the animal um, and is infected, the deer will start to show some clinical signs. Um, so there's a lot of research out there. And uh, one study in Missouri shows that the average herd mortality rate is about 42%. Um, so what we, what we start to see is that uh, that average might be 42%, but some areas may show mortality rates as low as maybe let's say 8%. Um, and then I've also seen some studies that show mortality rates as high as 84%. 
So you can see there's quite the range there. Um, and granted, this is, you know, a, probably one study of many, but that seems to be a pretty concrete one. Now, if fatal deer typically die within eight to 36 hours after showing symptoms, so it goes quick. You, you've probably heard um, this before if you've heard about EHD, that they, it tends to be a really quick acting virus. And once those deer do show up or start showing symptoms, um, they tend to die relatively, quick, relatively quickly. Um, some clinical and uh, clinical signs include uh, swelling of the face or neck, um, swollen or discolored tongue. Both EHD and blue tongue will have um, will have the effects of having either a swollen or discolored tongue. You know, a lot of times we look for lesions on the tongue. One of the first things um, that I've done when I found a deer that was suspected EHD, if it's fresh enough, you can open up the mouth and really look at the tongue and um, you'll be able to tell if it looks normal or not, especially if you've aged deer quite a bit. Um, a loss of appetite, uh, that's a big one. The deer aren't feeding. Uh, the fever, which is probably where 90% of the deer that uh, I've heard of have shown up are next to water. And so that fever is what's really driving them to the water source or where there would be a, a water source that's known to them. Even though there might not have been uh, water there now, there was there was places where I had uh, checked out deer that had died next to like a dried creek bed, or um, even I've had pictures of people send send me photos of deer that had died in, in people's lawns, actually uh, right next to um, bird baths. So the deer were looking for any sort of water they could possibly find. Um, that other thing, excessive salivation, that's kind of going back to my title slide. You saw that uh, that bug kind of foaming at the mouth. That that uh, area is is kind of it's tricky because sometimes people will will come out and think it's CWD, which is that's also another common uh, sign. So we want to obviously get a sample from deer that you see foam at your mouth so you can uh, collect it and then submit it. But kind of like with a lot of things in science, we can always speculate, but without sending some kind of test result to a lab, um, we can't be certain that it's EHD. So a lot of the deer that uh, I was, you know, got reported to or reported to me were, were a few days old. And, and the DEC really needs samples that are less than 24 hours um, since the deer has died um, to collect a sample. They usually collect from uh, internal organs like the spleen and then that gets sent to the pathology lab up in Del Mar and Albany um, to Kevin Hines and then he'll test it um, and it'll come back if it's EHD or not. So I just have a little bit of a range map here. Um, there's a couple different colors on here. The, the red dots are going to be areas that um, there were 10 or more deer reported that I've heard about um, and then the orange areas are going to be um, areas where I personally have heard less than 10. Um, it'd be interesting to see what the audience here has heard or, uh, or seen or been reported. So if you guys have um, numbers of specific towns, if you could in the chat box, as I kind of go through this, just put in uh, what you found. So maybe um, just a rough estimate of how many deer you know and then the town that it was from. Um, and if you could maybe give me a time time frame in the month and uh, the day, that, that would be really helpful um, because we're still all gathering information on this, right? There's not that much out there. So I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to see what everyone else has to say. So in late August, I had received a few um, messages and calls about deer dying in Cold Spring and um, it just so happened that the deer looked to be healthy, but they were near roadways, um, but they were laying directly in um, water sources, in creek beds or near uh, swamps or wetlands or vernal pools. What I thought was interesting, about that same time, um, I started hearing about a couple deer in Goshen um, that turned up near water sources as well. And I immediately said to myself, well, could be a coincidence, but it could be EHD. And at that time, um, when I had mentioned that, everybody was still a little skeptical about it. EHD hasn't been around in New York for a while. And um, everyone was really kind of quiet about it and said, well, you know, we'll have to see how things play out. 
And then as time uh, got on, as we got towards the last few days of August, um, the reports started coming in. Um, there was people finding dead deer up in Newburgh near Chadwick Lake. There was people finding a bunch of deer out near uh, Walden. Uh, there was people finding dead deer in Fishkill and Hopewell Junction in that area. And then there was a bunch of people finding uh, dead deer out in Patterson. And um, then we got into Putnam Valley. I heard about some deer that had uh, that had died in Putnam Valley, but in lower numbers. Um, and the word, the numbers just kept going up, and the towns kept on popping on the map. So as you start to see more of these towns pop up, Falling, Cornwall, New Paltz, um, and then we started to see out near Stewart, people are getting ready for hunting season, so they're in those public land areas, and you start getting them near Stewart. And then we had West West Point and Fort Montgomery, Beacon, and then over near Mayapack. So as you can start to see, there's really a trend here, um, kind of along that I-84 corridor, um, both on the east and west sides of the Hudson. And the, the red areas are where I personally heard accounts of, of you know 10 or 20 or more deer um, being found in those townships. And then the orange or yellow dots are our lower numbers, probably less than 10. Um, and that's just what I personally found. So it could be way more than that, or it could be less. Those are just personal accounts. Uh, a lot, a lot of the information that's out there is is um, kind of unofficial, and it'll be interesting to see um, what the numbers actually shake out to be when the DEC releases some kind of statement on this, whether that be in the end of this year or next year or whatever the case is. So it's kind of getting into what, so what are we really found here? Um, what can we really put together? There's a, there's a lot going on in a lot of places and it seems to be like certain areas are finding a lot of deer. Some areas aren't finding very much deer at all like here in Black Rock Forest. So areas with high deer densities seem to be experiencing significant mortality, right? So the more deer you have living in closer quarters, um, we're starting to find that those, those deer are being affected greater um, and that, that starts to make a lot more sense as we kind of piece this puzzle together, right? So agriculture and suburban habitats appear to be hotspots. Those areas like on the western part of uh, Orange County where you have some ag and some farms, um, you know, we have crop fields, we got corn, you may have uh, alfalfa, soybeans, uh, clover, onions, whatever the case is, there's potential for deer to be um, feeding in large numbers, right? So you may see a, a large group of deer feeding. Um, you know, 10, 15, 20 or more at a time. And also in suburban habitats, what, what pretty much everybody, um, everybody knows that your, your hostas and all of your flowers uh, tend to go missing pretty quickly, um, especially around here in Cornwall and other areas, uh, Cold Spring too. We have plenty of deer in our suburban habitats, right? It's not uncommon to drive through a neighborhood and say like Cornwall or New Windsor or Walden or Wellkill, see a whole bunch of deer. Um, and those deer are all feeding in the same yard, they're all feeding in large groups, you know, and that happens to be um, a, a problem for them because that creates a better opportunity for a larger group of deer to be uh, exposed to midges that may be uh, contain the virus. And then what we've kind of seen is those larger forested tracts of land um, still experience mortality, but it appears to be fewer in numbers and it seems to be uh, in lower elevations. So areas like, let's say Black Rock, West Point, maybe Scunamonk, um, as you get out into uh, closer to Ulster County, you, you have uh, kind of the Walker Valley region and on Pine Bush, um, all these areas, larger chunks of land, we've heard of a few deer turning up dead that are suspected to be EHP, but it's not those 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, cases. So that's kind of what I found. I've spent a lot of time um, both in Orange County and Putnam County and in Dutchess County since this kind of started looking for dead deer. Um, and although, you know, there are a few out there, I haven't found too many in the higher elevations in those larger tracts of land. I have heard reports of, of deer closer to uh, the Hudson on the borders of, let's say, like Storm King State Park, um, Hudson Highland State Park. There have been quite a few uh, cases showing up around the river that are on the borders of those uh, tracks, but again, with lower elevations. So. Um, and one of the things that I really started to key in on was that uh, most of the reports are, are adult deer. So deer that are, you know, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half and up, 
um, and very, very few fawns or yearlings were reported. Um, it'd be interesting to see if you guys uh, have heard or seen, personally seen any uh, yearlings or fawns um, that have uh, potentially uh, take, been taken from EHD. If you, you know, have, please put that in the, in the chat and we'll kind of get through that later. Um, and many deer are dying in close proximity to houses or water sources. Um, the deer get that fever, their bodies are overheating, they know they need water, so they're going to previously known water sources, right? So deer oftentimes in times of stress will go to areas that they've been to before and they already have experience with and they're going to go to where that closest water is once they start feeling the symptoms. And ponds, um, reservoirs, Creeks um, and rivers are, are hot spots, but also um, we've really started to see that, uh, especially in those suburban areas, deer are walking right up to people's uh, houses and patios and stuff, and that's where they end up uh, succumbing to their injuries. So that's usually when you get those reports from the homeowners, it's close to their house. And the other thing is, you know, the deceased deer deteriorate quickly, especially with the warm temperatures that we had in August and early September. And that kind of really reduces the amount of time to get a sample. Um, and a lot of people don't actually um, get a chance to get a sample before that deer is, is too far past where they can actively sample from the, you know, the orders of the deer. So um, one thing that I think was a common question between all of us is when's that rain coming? Um, there's a picture from Black Rock Forest. I think it was just like September 9th, something like that. Bone dry streams. Um, and it's still dry out there now. Uh, we've gotten a few rain events, but I wouldn't say anything to the point um, where we have a lot of rain and a lot of water moving through the forest. Most of the wetlands are still pretty dry. Um, and I think that was the other question is when's that frost coming? Um, there's been a couple of close, close calls with the frost. Everybody wants to know when the frost is coming through the way or anticipating uh, the, the midges to no longer be around. So I, I think this is uh, also another common question between everyone. Why 2020? It seems like this has been uh, quite a year for, for both wildlife and humans and, and everything else. Um, but that's just how the ships fall sometimes. So the biggest thing is we haven't really had any previous outbreaks. So there's no herd immunity, right? So if um, let's say 10 deer get bit and um, have been infected with EHD, um, and let's say half of them succumb to their injuries and half are, half are left, those other five deer uh, are gonna have immunity for what we would believe to be uh, the rest of their, uh, their time. And as those deer fade out and, and die off, there's no more herd immunity, right? So we've also had uh, a hot, dry summer resulting in drought, especially as we entered August. Um, if you guys remember last year, it was super, super dry as we went through the fall, but we did have a little bit of rain um, in the summer. So that might've helped us last year. But with this year, it was so dry entering August that we really started to see the, the effects a lot earlier, I think. Um, and as resources become scarce, deer will congregate around any available food and water. So as those deer begin to congregate, you'll see that creates a, a, a really bad recipe for any kind of disease, whether that be from deer to deer transmission or from a host um, or a vector to the deer, especially like EHD. Um, and then, like I said, I mentioned earlier, these conditions really create ideal breeding habitat for midges, um, kind of those mudflat areas, standing shallow ponds, like that picture um, I had earlier, and then streams and creeks. So um, one last thing here, with deer populations um, seem to be really high in the areas where we've been reported high mortality. If that, um, that might just happen to be coincidence, but I believe that it has to do with uh, the number of deer that that land can physically support, um, which just gets into kind of your herd management as a whole. So a lot of people will say, you know, what can we do? How can we help? Um, unfortunately, there's not much we can do um once the outbreak is started uh hard frost will kill the midges um and then you know approximately a week or so two weeks after that it will end up um but some things we can kind of be proactive about or, or talking with hunters uh or talking with just landowners in general so doing these kind of events like we're doing right now are super helpful um see what people are, are finding out in the woods talking to people who spend a lot of time out there 
um, and, and just working as a, as a group or a region um, to kind of work on this together because it's, it's hard to help once it started, but for forwardly and, and going into the future, we, we might be able to be better educated about that and things, events like this really help. Um, one thing that we do at Black Rock Forest is a spring pellet count. So we do that in March. Um, and we basically go out and look at the piles of deer poop on the forest floor. And um, we use a little bit of math and we start to get a rough estimate of our deer density. We also do some winter tracking, which John has done for decades. Um, and then we kind of cross-reference that. And uh, something that I, I like to do also is look at our browse surveys, um, see how many uh, buds are being browsed. And with those three things, we can kind of get an idea of what our deer density is and how many deer are actually on the landscape. So that'll be something I'm really looking forward to uh, this spring. And um, I encourage you all to kind of look into those different uh, different options. And if it's something that you'd like to do on your on your own property or, or like to get involved with, we do a spring tele count. Hopefully we'll be able to pull that this year. Um, and there will be more information about that on, on our website and on our social media. Also, we're going to be looking at our harvest data this year. So the number of deer harvested, age, um, weight, and overall health. We're going to be looking at the, the weights for each age class. Um, and that'll really tell us uh, how well the deer are doing. Um, and we want to use these tools to make better management plans in the future. Um, a lot of people have asked me, like, you know, do you think the DEC is going to close hunting season or, or things like that? But um, I don't think they're going to make a split second decision like that. They're going to wait a little while and see how everything plays out and see the real impact um, on our region before making uh, before making any changes to uh, their management plan. So kind of in the meantime, this is a recent photo I took of some fresh deer scat, just to let you know that not all the deer are dead. There are plenty of deer out there, um, especially where I have been recently, but um, you know, you might not see this, the same kind of activity. And then uh, I'll be done here shortly and, and we can kind of get into it. I know it's a lot of words to get through, um, but I want to cover a lot of your questions ahead of time. So what does this mean for deer populations? Um, one thing we've seen is some areas got hit really hard and some other, some other areas that were relatively close um, in distance didn't get hit as hard. So those impacts are highly variable. Um, those numbers really vary. Um, and our outbreaks are regionally based and they might vary a lot across the state. If you go um, you know, to let's say the, the Capital District, they may have heard, you know, hey, there's a lot of deer dying down below the Catskills and Hudson Valley, but we haven't seen anything um, or you might even talk to someone uh, within Orange County that hasn't found it, and someone not someone else in Orange County has, has found a ton of deer. So it really kind of varies. Um, and then those areas with the high mortality outbreaks typically don't reoccur annually. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's cyclic in nature, so maybe every five to seven years, something like that, or every five to ten years. But you're not really going to see it year after year after year, right? And that kind of comes back to that herd immunity. So the deer that have survived and have been infected previously, will hopefully um, have some immunity and, and not to come to their injuries. And uh, one thing we can do is just increase our efforts to monitor our populations and, and make responsible decisions for the upcoming years. And like I mentioned, maybe not making kind of a split second decision based off what we saw this year, but as we really start to analyze um, what we're hearing and what we're seeing and what our data tells us, um, we'll start to make better management. Some just additional impacts. People are always talking about, well, you know, we had a lot of deer die. How long is it going to take until we get our deer numbers back? And that's obviously going to vary based on, on your habitat and, and what you have for the deer there. But we see it, it takes several years. I've talked to a lot of people who um, are out in the Midwest and deal with this a lot more. And it's not uncommon for them to have really bad die off. And within, you know, two to three years, they start to really see the deer pop back up uh, to the numbers they were. Um, but the only way we're really going to know how that population progresses is, is through those uh, through those surveys and through really looking at our data. Um, and then obviously deer that survive infection will have immunity. And uh, one thing I'm really going to be looking out for, and I encourage everyone else, especially um, especially hunters, um, take a look at the hooves on the deer. The hooves will often show kind of interruptions in growth. And some people out in the Midwest call it like slowed hooves, or they may kind of curve up. Um, I haven't seen any evidence of that in New York, but it obviously, uh, with it not being that common, we may not see it. So be on the lookout for kind of uh, altered hooves on the deer. You, you may notice it's kind of like if you were to uh, 
hit your nail with a with a hammer, it'll start to grow in really weird over you know the next year or so. So I'll be looking out for that. And um, one other thing, kind of a positive note, is some areas that may now have lower deer densities um, will have uh, better resources for the surviving population, resulting in healthier deer. Right. So we may start to see those age classes, like those year and a half old bucks or or fawns. Um, are now going to have more food and more space, and they're also uh, probably going to be uh, a more quality and healthier uh, weight class for their age. So we'll really start to look at that in the year. That's enough of, of me kind of chatting. I'd like to kind of work with everyone else and talk to everyone else and see what we got. I'll, I'll kind of look through these uh, the questions now um, and figure out how I stop sharing. There we go. All right. Thanks. So I figure out where this chat box went. Oh, there's 17. Okay. Okay. Um, I see we have a question from Greg. Um, he says DC says no long-term impacts, but I guess that's subjective. I would imagine three to four years to get off numbers back for the way last season. Um, with the doe numbers down, breeding numbers lost will be down. Um, what's the effect rates on the fur? Yeah, so as far as uh, it taking three to four years to get the mature bucks, I mean, let's say in a worst case scenario, you might have all of your mature bucks, so this, you know, three and a half, four and a half, five and a half year old bucks um, are no longer in that population. So it's going to take whatever time um, for the youngest deer or the, the oldest deer now to get to that age class. So that could potentially happen. Um, but as far as uh, herd redistribution back into heavily uh, impacted areas and the rebound rate, I think it's really important to look at uh, your habitat, look at what's keeping, what's holding your deer in your habitat, right? Do you have cover? Um, do you have really good fawn recruitment? Do you have really good fawning um, habitat? And do you also have the food for the deer? Because let's say, you know, there was 50 deer in, in this, you know, sport plus separate chunk. And, you know, that got reduced to, let's say, 20. Well, now there's, uh, there's that many more opportunities and that many more um, availability, that much more availability of food source for the deer, right? There's less competition between the deer to find, let's say, X amount of food. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that you'll probably see it may take a little while. Um, and it just like when you log an area, you kind of take out all of, all of the food sources for the deer, and then after a few years, you really start to see that the deer starting to hit those areas really hard. So that's what I'd expect. Maybe a few years in the areas we have a super high mortality rate, um, but in the next three to four to five years, you'll start to see that really coming back, and, and you'll have some really quality deer um, in those areas. Got a question from Katrina if they don't want to see me at all. Um, I'm not sure if I if I mentioned that I think I did, but with that 42 average 42 percent fatality rate, um, that means roughly about an average of 60 percent survival rate. So six out of ten deer surviving um, is better than the opposite. The split of that being 40 percent of the deer surviving 60 percent mortality. Um, so Bill mentioned that. Uh, Scott. Scott said, we have found two on our hunting land at the Tipsy, one near a swamp, one on the edge of the two weeks ago. Um, property across the road found 15, right? So that's kind of what I was talking, and it's super variable, right? So one property may only found two, and some people across the road found 15, right? So close proximity to one another, super different findings. Um, Christine said, I have four down on our property in Cornwall, all near the stream that runs through it, right? And that's a common thing that we're going to start to see. Um, Campbell Hall outside. Yep, I I've heard a lot about Campbell Hall recently, um, especially on the forums and especially on the Facebook groups. That's been a super super hot spot. I think I had kind of included it in that the the Newburgh Stewart area on my map. Um, you know, hour and a half walk. Yep, in close proximity. Mature does fawn several bucks for each class. Interesting um, with the fawns, but um, definitely understandable with a mature deer. It seems that the disease uh, is not really well documented in, in only older deer classes, but that's just what we've seen. Um, 
and it's you know it's definitely uh, possible for for any age class of people to to end up dying from it. Um, yep, that sunk of death and decay everywhere you went. I've heard that quite a bit over the past few weeks. Um, yep, thirty plus year Walden. Yep. Um, yep. So. Um, I guess just to touch on reporting, Christine said she mentioned that she reported to the DEC no response. Um, the DEC has gotten bombarded with calls, probably why um, maybe you also haven't heard back from them is there's people calling and I, I spoke with our regional biologist, uh, Jonathan Russell a few weeks ago. And um, you know, there's hundreds of calls coming in about EHD and deer a week. So um, they're obviously a small staff and uh, they don't always get back to everyone. So uh, that's probably why. Uh, two that we found were young spikes. Um, let's see what else we got. Yep, Campbell Hall again, Goshen Swamp, 210 deer. Um, Warwick, yep. Yeah, so related to climate change, warmer, et cetera, right? Um, I think there's there's a lot of people that that uh, the light bulbs start to go off in their head. Well, uh, we never had this before. Why now? And there's uh, a lot of things that go on in science that are like that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if this becomes a, a common occurrence now, especially in the numbers that we've had. Um, and it's definitely been warmer and drier the past few years, at least. Um, First one that Jan said, the first one we found was August 30th, three more fatalities, all drowned in the lake. Yep. And then will the low acorn crop this year affect recovery? Okay, I'm glad someone mentioned the low acorn crop. Um, acorns are few and far between. There's a few places that I found a couple trees that are dropping acorns, but other than that, not too much. We had a late frost, uh, billows in May 9th, somewhere around there. Um, and that killed a lot of the oak flowers, which then absolutely um, kind of knocked out our acorn production this year. And, and when we get years, that's not uncommon. Um, that does happen. Um, but what you'll start to see is those deer are really keying in on those alternative food sources, right? So the, the browse in, in the woodlots and their cover habitat types, and then your fields, um, your ag areas, um, and then also in your suburban areas, the grasses, right? So a lot of the deer that I've been seeing are in those fields feeding for longer periods of time. They're bedding super close to there. And as far as that affecting the recovery, um, that'll have to do with how uh, how everything goes this winter. And if we, we notice a super, uh, super harsh winter, I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see a little bit longer of, of a time frame there. Um, Elaborate on the salt issue and impact on older bucks. So the the salt issue, um, as far as the salt goes, uh, a few people have definitely documented that the midges are able to breed in water that has has a high um, high salinity, um, and, and that's something that we test for when we're doing macroinvertebrate sampling um, in a lot of all of our different uh, reservoirs and streams and stuff like that. Um, and what they found is that the midges can can live in those higher salinity areas and also live in areas that um, like mosquitoes wouldn't normally breed in, right? Mosquito larvae tend to usually breed in um, open water um, with less vegetation and less organic matter, whereas the midges um, can breed in those high organic matter, low oxygen, um, shallow pools. Um, and the impact on older bucks, yeah, it seems like uh, someone finds a really big buck um, that's suspected uh, to have passed from EHD, and everybody hears about it. Everyone wants to um, wants to spread it around, and I've definitely seen my fair share of pictures of older bucks. And um, the the reality is that the there will take some time for you to kind of get those older age class of deer back, but the quality of the deer that have survived um, will probably improve greatly. Um, and there's obviously going to be a little bit less competition. And it's always interesting to kind of see how that's going to impact things on the long term, but you know, we won't know until things play out. Uh, I think that's it for questions, right? Let's see what else. Anybody have anything else? Jeremy, I'm not sure. 
can't see her right now. She's still here. Um, not far as far as questions. If anyone has a question, I guess you can um, I don't know, raise your hand and I'll try and uh, try and see everybody. If you have a question, I guess I can. Uh, Oh, I can. I do have the option to unmute, so I can unmute you. But if you have a question, raise your hand or turn your camera on or whatever. I'd be happy to try and answer it for you. Aaron, this has been great. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm glad you could join us. <laughs> Thanks to OCLT and BlackRock to uh, having hosted this. It's been terrific. First time dealing with EHD in the area. It's uh, Good to know what's going on. Thanks. Thank you all for tuning in. Any other questions? Oh. Aaron, uh, if people have questions that they're uh, going to come up with later, perhaps uh, could you provide your email address and maybe um, you can point them in the right direction to another contact or perhaps you can answer the question yourself. Yeah, I will. Um, I'll throw my email in um, contact info in the chat box. Um, if that works for everybody. Um, and then you can email me or you can uh, you can reach out and I'd be happy to try and answer your questions. By, um, by all means, I'm not a deer biologist, um, but uh, I do spend a lot of time looking at deer, studying deer and um, talking to people about deer. So um, be happy to try and answer your questions. And I really be looking forward to hear what the BEC has to say as we kind of move through, um, you know, the next few months and, and get, to, get through hunting season, right? Um, so. Aaron, did you uh, mention about, because when we talked earlier today, you mentioned to me that um, there have been reports of deer being a uh, deceased deer laying alongside a bird bath. And someone had mentioned that in the comment section. So, um, yeah, did, um, sorry. Right. um, yeah, so I guess as, as far as that, um, uh, that seemed odd when I first saw it. And then I just kind of put the pieces together. It starts to make a little bit of sense. Right. So if there's, you know, no water whatsoever, um, natural water that is on the landscape or in this deer's core area or where they're spending the majority of their time or even just in close proximity to where they started to experience the symptoms and humans are, are putting out bird baths and that's the source of water. Um, the deer wants to quench its thirst and wants to cool down. So um, it would make plenty of sense why the deer happens to, um, to be laying next to a bird bath. Um, I think a lot of the deer that I got uh, report or that were reported to me um, were in areas that didn't actually have water in them, but there were areas that were previously known to the deer to hold water, right? So the swamps are pretty dry still. Um, they've been dry. Uh, I've talked to John a couple times about this and it looks like the our wetlands and, and our streams won't really fully get um, back up to where they were until we uh, until we get to the springtime. And if we get a decent snow cover this year, that will eventually melt in let's say March and April, and then that will return uh, the levels to what they were or should be. Um, so that's kind of kind of where we're going with that. Um, any other uh, anything? Any other questions? Someone's got to have something out there. I actually have one more, if you don't mind. I uh, years ago I purchased mosquito dunks. They look like the little donuts you can yep. toss into uh, stagnant water, and it's supposed supposed to kill uh, mosquito larvae. Um, it's not being suggested at this time that people do that on their own property. Um, but uh, would you happen to know if um, that's effective against midges? Yeah, I'm not sure. I did see a couple people who have talked about that. Um, me personally, I probably wouldn't um, wouldn't do that. But um, as far as as that as an effective treatment, um, I'm not sure if that would really help too much. I'm not sure how you would kind of quantify the impact that it had. But um, I think as we as we get further into this year and uh, as we as time progresses, you'll start to see people trying new things. Um, some of those which may be somewhat effective or or may have alternative impact. So it'll be interesting to see 
um, what happens. Anyone else? No? Did I miss anything in the comments? Well, thank you guys all for, for tuning in. Um, happy to see some familiar faces, Lotus and Andrew. Thank you for tuning in. And um, I just want to thank you guys, the Orange County Land Trust, for, for reaching out to us and, and having, having the ability to do this um, and, and meeting some new people. And um, especially the, the QDMA chapter out there, I'd like to learn a little bit, a little bit about you guys too. Um, and uh, it's always good to uh, be in the loop, as they say, right? Um, so I guess uh, if you don't have any more questions, um, we kind of kind of let everyone get on with their night. We kind of right in on an hour here, so I think that's probably time to call it, right? Yeah, thank you all for coming and uh, cross your fingers for an early hard frost. Yep, it's looking like uh, Halloween, November 1st here. We'll see. Got nine, nine or 10 days, something like that. All right, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys.